Praise the Lord. We'll rise up and spend some time in prayer. We have some little time before the transmission. I'm waiting for you to stand up. Thank you. We commit ourselves to the Lord in prayer that tonight the Bible study will really be enlightening and practical. And that today as you come, that the Lord will open your eyes of understanding that the word of God will enrich your life today. Why don't you open your mouth and just talk to the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Yeah. Heavenly Father, we bless your name tonight because of your love. Thank you for your spirit you have given unto us to interpret and apply all the time this word of life to our hearts. Lord, we pray as we come together tonight, you keep us awake at alert so that we can pay attention and focus on this word in Jesus' name. We pray that you draw us closer to yourself by the cord of this word. That your love will work mightily in every one of our hearts in Jesus' name. That those of us already born again will see the kind of life a new creature in Christ ought to live. Every day of the year, every moment of the day. And Lord, we pray for those who have not known you yet as Lord and Savior. That they'll come to put their trust and their faith and their confidence in you. So that they'll be born again and then join us in the kingdom in Jesus name. Bless everyone today Lord. And help us Lord to take this word of life. Take it to our neighbors so that our neighbors too will have the knowledge of salvation. And the knowledge of the truth. So that they and us, us and them, will be able to get to the kingdom of God eternally in Jesus' name. Bless your people here tonight. And all over the world, here in Nigeria, in Africa, in Europe, in America, in Asia, everywhere where we're listening to the word of God, I pray the same blessing you give us here tonight. You give everyone in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you very much. You can see that we come once again to our Bible study. This is a Bible school. And this is where we have the depths of the knowledge of the word of God. That will prepare us, number one, for life. Number two, for ministry. Number three, for eternity. As we come to study the word of God, it's not just to study and to have hedge knowledge. We want to have more than head knowledge. We want to have heart experience. So that as we study the word of God, there will be this association, interaction, and fellowship with the almighty God himself. Through faith in Christ and through the grace of God. And that we call salvation. Not only that, it prepares us not only for salvation, but for service. That as we come to learn, we're not just learners and forever learners who become teachers of the word. That this same word that we're learning, we're able to take it out of here and take it to our neighbors everywhere, wherever they are found. And then not only that here we have salvation and here we have service unto the lord and unto the people of god in eternity i want to be able to reign with the lord it prepares us then for eternity as well i believe that's why you have come tonight and i believe that this is the purpose and the goal the dream in your heart salvation service and then the glory of god eternally we'll be looking at matthew chapter 5 and we'll study from verse 1 all through to verse 37. Today we're in verse 38. Please open your Bible with me as we read. Matthew chapter 5, reading from verse 38. Ye have heard that it has been said, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, that ye receive not evil. But whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man will seal thee at the law, take and take away thy coat. Let him take, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, 
go with him to him. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. Those are the five verses we're looking at tonight. And these verses of scripture, they appear very simple. In fact, there are some people that will say that Jesus meant what he said, and he said what he meant. And then he said, full stop, that is all. Then we say, yes, he said what he meant. And he meant what he said. But what do you understand of what he said? What do you understand of what he meant? All these verses of scripture that I've read to you. Actually, if you don't have the spirit of Christ, number one. The mind of Christ, number two. The love of Christ, number three. The life of Christ, number four. The wisdom of Christ, number five. You're going to misinterpret. And you're going to misapply. You're going to misunderstand each of these verses as you look at the verses. In fact, we have different sections of society at that time and at this time that misunderstand, misinterpret, and misapply. These verses of scripture we're looking at tonight. As you look at verse 38, the old time Pharisees misunderstood that. Ye have heard, it had been said, an eye for an eye. And it chews for it chews. And the Pharisee will jump up and say, that's exactly what God said. And that's exactly what we're going to do. We're, we're duty bound to be obedient to the word of God. And it says, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. Teeth for touch. But you need to understand and then you find another modern day group of people. We call them the pacifists. The people that say there, should be, there is no war. It's like they want us to begin to live in the millennium today. It, it should be at the time as if Christ is reigning already. And they say they have their own motivation from verse 39. But I say unto you that she resists not evil. But whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And you see, if you don't really understand the whole Bible, you're not going to understand those two verses. We need to understand what did Jesus mean? How did Jesus himself apply that to his life? How did the disciples understand that at the time in the life of Jesus Christ as well as in the Acts of the Apostles after the Holy Ghost had come? And then you go to the next verse. And if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. If you were to just take that literally and not find out what did he mean by that? Who does that apply to? When does that apply to our lives? You're going to be a person that will be the doormat of everybody here on earth. And everybody will be dribbling you here and there. You'll think you're applying the word of God. But there's no wisdom. As I told you, you must have, number one, the spirit of Christ. The mind of Christ. The love of Christ. Also, you must have the life of Christ, the example of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the wisdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 41, And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. You know, if you apply that literally, it's like if you are coming to the Bible study, and somebody just met you and said, Hey, stop, on, stop there. Carry this thing for me. And carry it to my shop. I'm going to the Bible study. Are you not a Christian? I said, carry it. I compel you. After all, Jesus said, and whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. So you will drop your intention of coming to the Bible study and you carry his load for him and then you get to his shop already half of the Bible study is gone. And because you are trying to obey a verse you don't understand, then you say, any other thing I can carry for you, I want to go the second mile. 
And if you live like that all your life, you'll just be a fool to be trampled upon by everybody because you don't understand what Jesus was talking about. And here we are now, verse 40, to give to him that asketh thee. The only money I have is the money I want to use, that I want to spend to pay the school fees of my child. But Jesus said, I should give to anyone that asks me. And therefore you give out that school fees and there's nothing to pay. And you say, I'm trying to obey the Bible. That's why we came to the Bible study so that we can rightly divide the word of truth. Because if you don't understand the word of God, you're going to turn everything upside down. And then you're going to live a life which is not actually your own life. You're going to live for everybody else on earth. You'll not have any goal, any dream, any passion, any destination, anywhere to go. People will just grab you and pull you here and there because of your lack of understanding of the word of God. And you say from him that will borrow of thee, turn not away. Wonderful verses and difficult verses. That we need to put together. And we need to see what the Lord is telling us. To start with, let's understand. I've been talking about the spirit of Christ. I've been talking about the mind of Christ. I've been talking about the love of Christ. I've been talking about the life of Christ and the wisdom of Christ. We need all that so we can understand the word of God. And properly apply the word of God that we study. In Romans chapter 8, I'm reading to you from verse 9. Romans chapter 8, verse 9. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man has not the spirit of Christ, is none of his. That means to start with those who are not born again, they do not have the spirit of Christ. And they cannot interpret for us these verses we're looking at. Don't allow your neighbor, your landlord, or your colleague, or anybody around you to just pick up the word of God and say, Hey, let me tell you what Jesus said. Say, thank you. Hold it. You need the spirit of Christ to be able to interpret the scripture of Christ. And then I spoke about the mind of Christ in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16. For who has known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. That's what we need. The mind of Christ, the attitude of Christ, the understanding of Christ. And it is that the spirit and the mind of Christ that will help us to be able to actually find out what is it the Lord is saying. Second Corinthians chapter 5, I'm reading verse 14. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us. That is it. The love of Christ constraineth us. It is when these three elements coming from Christ, it is when they are present within us, we'll be able to understand what Christ said, what Christ meant, and then we'll be able to do what Jesus Christ would have done if Jesus Christ were here for the love of Christ constraineth us. Because we thus judge that if one died for all, then were all dead. It is necessary then as we come before these scriptures to have the spirit of Christ, the mind of Christ, and the love of Christ in order to properly understand and appropriately apply these messages in your life. It's of great importance also to study the life of Christ. When he met with the Pharisees, how did he behave? And we know that his behavior, his conduct, his character never contradicted his message. He lived as he preached. And therefore, if you read the word of Christ and the message of Christ and say, what does this mean? How can I understand this? Look at the life of Christ, the way he lived. And then you pattern your life after that life of Christ in first John chapter 2 verse 6 he that says he abideth in him ought himself also to walk even as he walked the life of Christ 
And as you look at the life of Christ, and then you look at these verses we are reading, you say, yes, I understand now. This is how to understand what is said, how to apply what is said, how to follow after what he said. And so we learned as well that we must have the wisdom of Christ. The wisdom of Christ. As we look at this study today, living without revenge or retaliation. We're going to divide the message to three parts. Number one, misinterpretation of the law of retribution. The Pharisees misunderstood every part of the word of God. And it's good we understand their misunderstanding or their misrepresentation. Or their misinterpretation. Because there are still people today. In our day. In our time. In our age. There are many people today. Religious people. Like Pharisees and Sadducees. That will still turn the word of God. Upside down. And they are confused. And they want to confuse everybody else. And you will meet them. Every corner. At every turn of the way. That's the reason you need to know. What they misunderstood. What they misinterpreted so that when you meet them today, you'll say, yes, I've learned about you before. I've heard about you before. You do not interpret the word of God correctly. Number one, then, misinterpretation of the law of retribution. Number two, manifestation of a life without retaliation. What a wonderful world it will be. If we just were able to follow the life of Christ... And then we manifest a life without retaliation. What a family you will have. A first man and wife and parents and children could just have a life. A life without retaliation. What a wonderful church we will have. If everybody, the youth and the adults, the children and the women and everybody in the church, if we could just live a life without retaliation, what a wonderful society we will have. A wonderful company, corporation we will have. If everybody could just live a life without retaliation. That's the life Jesus lived. And that's the life he taught the believers. They like to live a life without retaliation. That's point number two. And then number three now, the master's model of love and righteousness. The master's model of love and righteousness. Let's come back to number one. Misinterpretation of the law of retribution. We're coming to Matthew chapter 5 verse 38. Matthew chapter 5, we're looking at verse 38. Ye have heard that it has been said, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. You have heard that it was said, when was that? Where was that? And to who was that said? You need to understand that. It is not enough to just say, I read something in the Bible. And the Bible says... A tooth for a tooth and an eye for an eye. You need to understand what is the interpretation of that. Why was that law given? Who makes the application of that law? Actually in the Old Testament, because the nation of Israel just became a nation. They had been a bunch of slaves when they were in the land of Egypt. And they were living a kind of jungle life. A kind of jungle life that is no slaves. If anybody did anything, they just took claws into their hands and they dealt with that individual. You remember Moses himself, that an Egyptian was fighting with an Israelite. And then he looked at them, the law of the jungle. That is how the animals dealt with one another. You've seen animals when they get angry in the public and then they, are, you know, they keep knocking at one another. Another one will come and then take part in the fight. It's just the law of the jungle. And so when they were slaves in the land of, in the land of Egypt, that's how they were living. And then when Moses saw that Egyptian and then the Israelite, he looked there and there. There was nobody. He finished that Egyptian killed him. And he didn't even feel anything because he was used to that. And then he went back home. He came back the second day and he saw two Israelites fighting. And he said, hey, what are you people doing? 
I was ready to take on one of you, except that I saw the bones of you are Israelites. And the other fellow said, get out of there. You want to kill me like you killed the Egyptian yesterday. You know the rest of the story. But now, when they came out of the land of Egypt, and they were going in the wilderness, the Lord wanted to regulate their lifestyle. And therefore, he now brought up the judiciary. And the judiciary he instructed the judiciary said Now human beings will offend one another And so they will bring their cases to you in the judiciary Now you judges Here is the way you are going to deal with them How are you going to deal with them When somebody comes and he says This fellow has taken this away from me You will investigate You will make inquisition If it is true that this individual has taken that from him, what you will do is, you will make this other fellow pay back exactly the same amount. Choose for choose. And eye for eye. Now what that Lord did for them is that it cautioned them not to just behave anyhow. You see, in the world in which we live today, instead of following that in the judiciary, they follow fines. What that means is, if somebody has done something bad, they will say, all right, we find you a hundred thousand dollars. If you can find it, that's all. Now, do you know what that does? What that does is that those who are rich will never suffer. And they can do anything because you just find them. Any amount you find them, they just go and dip their hand in their pocket or in their purse or in their bank account and bring it out and give it to the judge. And that's all. And they go to do another thing. But in Israel, God said, no, it, whether they are rich or they are poor, if you knock out somebody's teeth, don't find them, knock out his own teeth. You are not to do it personally. It is the judge that was to do it. It was a law for the judiciary. It was a law for the court. But now the Pharisees, they took that into their own hands personally. And then it became something like vendetta, like retaliation, like revenge. That if you did something to a Pharisee, he'll say, hey, I catch you. Tit for tat. Tooth for tooth and eye for eye. Pharisee, you are misapplying the word of God. That word is for the judge. It's not for you as an individual. Let me show you Deuteronomy chapter 19. Deuteronomy chapter 19. And we're reading from verse 15. Deuteronomy chapter 19. Verse 15. One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin. In any sin that his sin is. Already you see when it says one witness, it means they are now at the law court. And somebody is witnessing to it that A offended B. Or B injured A. And there is a witness and they said it must not even be limited to one witness. It says at the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses shall the matter be established. That means then that they will take very careful caution or precaution to find out who is right, who is wrong, who has offended the other, and who has injured the other. In verse 16, if he, if he, falls, if he falls witness, rise up against any man to testify against him. That, that which is wrong, then both the men between whom the controversy is shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judges. Do you see this? It's a law for the judges. That the judges will examine these people and will find out very carefully what they have done. And then we are told which shall be in those days and the judges shall make diligent inquisition. They will not be in a hurry. They will find out actually who has injured the other. And behold, if the witness be a false witness and has testified falsely against his brother, then shall you do unto him as he had thought to have done unto his brother. It is not his brother. That will do unto him as he thought to have done to him is the judge, it's the court. This is the judiciary. That, that's the thing that the Pharisees missed. 
they thought they were to apply this by themselves tooth for tooth and eye for eye no this is not for personal application this is for the law court that you judges will do unto him as they thought to have done to his brother so shall not put evil away from among you and then it goes on in the next verse and those which remain shall hear and fear and shall henceforth commit no more any evil among you and thine eye shall not pity but life shall go for life eye for eye tooth for tooth hand for hand foot for foot that's the meaning that's what the lord was uh, you know teaching the people he was telling them you will not take loss into your hand if somebody offends you you will not say hey i know somebody wearing the word of god tooth for tooth and eye for eye you pluck out my eye i'm going to pluck out your no you cannot do that you cannot do that even in the old testament you have to wait for the judges to make inquisition inquiry examination you have to wait for them to call in witnesses and you have to wait for two or three witnesses and they have to find out diligently the matter all the details of the matter and then when they are found out you will wait for their judgment and they are the people to carry out the judgment you are not the person to carry it out yourself tooth for tooth and eye for eye that's that's all it means and now let's look at some people that didn't go through that process and they didn't, they didn't want to wait for this moderate law that the Lord had given them. Look at Esther chapter 3. Esther chapter 3, reading from verses 5 and 6. And when Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence, then was Haman full of wrath. And he thought it scorn to lay hands on Mordecai alone. For they had showed him the people of Mordecai. Where, wherefore Haman sought to destroy all the Jews that were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus. Even the people of Mordecai. You understand that? That's exactly what the Lord was trying to prevent. One man called Mordecai. Had offended Haman. And what did Mordecai do? All, as Haman was coming, all the other people bent low. They bent down. Maybe they prostrated. Like they do in some cultures. And the Mordecai will not prostrate. He said, no. I will need only to the Jehovah God of heaven. And these knees will not bow down. Will not bend down to any man on earth. And Mordecai and Amon became offended. Wait a minute. If he was to apply the law, how would he have done it? Number one, he would have gone to the king to report the matter to the king. Because tooth for tooth and eye for eye is not to be applied personally. It's not something you are to just say, he offended me, I'm going to deal with him. You will report to the judges, report to the king. And then they'll call Mordecai. Are there witnesses? Yes, there are witnesses. All the other people that bench now, they'll come as witnesses. All right, what did he do? He disrespected me. Remember, it is tooth for tooth, not teeth for tooth, not three teeth for one tooth. It is eye for eye, not eyes for eye. One eye for one eye. So, he disrespected me. So, what are we to do? Tooth for tooth implies, let's do something to him to show disrespect unto him. That's all they could do. Under that law of retribution. But now, Haman said, I'm not waiting for tooth for tooth. One, I'm going to kill him. That punishment is much, much greater than what he did to you. That's exactly what the Lord was preventing. Not only that I will kill him, I will kill all the Jews throughout the whole region. This is madness. This is terrible. Because it's not going beyond tooth for tooth and eye for eye. And there are not people like that today. Their emotion gets into their head. 
The fury, their wrath gets into their head. And they have the short madness. And in that period of short madness, they even go beyond tooth for tooth and eye for eye. And they want to kill the man completely because of what he has done. They want to even kill his children and the whole family. That's what Mordecai wants on him and wanted to do. And that's exactly what the Lord said. No, you are not to do that. Do you remember sometimes... Uh, Samson. Let's look at Judges chapter 15. Judges chapter 15. We're reading from verse 1. But it came to pass within a while, a while after. And in the time when the witch harvest of the witch harvest that Samson visited his wife with a kid. And he said, I will go into my wife, into the chamber. And her father would not suffer, will not permit, will not allow him to go in. And her father said, I verily thought that thou had totally hated her. Therefore, I gave her to thy companion. Is not her younger sister fairer than she? Take her, I pray thee, instead of her. Now Samson was offended. Well, that family had done something wrong to Samson. They gave his wife out to another person. And now Samson came and said, where is my wife? And the father said, oh, we thought you don't want her anymore. We thought you, you don't love her anymore because we didn't see you for some time. Therefore, we've given her to another man. Remember now, tooth for tooth and eye for eye. Samson, you feel offended. Yes, I'm offended. You feel unhappy? Yes, I'm unhappy. You are sad about this? Of course I am sad. What are you going to do? I know what I'm going to do. Before you take any action, Samson, can I tell you what to do? Go to the judges. Find out who the judges are, who the elders are. Report the matter and say this is what they have done. Leave it in the hands of the judges. That's God's word. But you know Samson, he was an Israelite. But Samson did not really care for the law of God. If you, if you look at his life, he took laws into his son. In verse 3, And Samson said, Concerning them now shall I be blameless that the Philistines, that the Philistines do, I do them a displeasure. And Samson went and caught 300 foxes and uh, took fire brands and turned tail to tail and put a fire brand in the midst between two tails and when he had set the brands on fire he let them go into the standing corn of the philistines and burnt up both the stalks and also the standing corn and the vineyards and the olives he went beyond the affairs it's not just the family that offended him now that he retaliated on. Just everybody in that community. Just because the man got angry. He got mad. His blood rushed into his brain. And the offense clouded his eyes. And he became power drunk. You know, sometimes you, you misuse your power when people offend you. If you don't understand the scriptures... You'll misuse your wisdom. You'll misuse your opportunity. You'll misuse your skill. You'll misuse your knowledge. Something misused his power. When somebody, a family offended him. And then he released all these foxes with fire brands in their tails into their, into their field. And then we're told in verse 6, then the Philistines said, who has done this? And he answered, Samson, the son-in-law of the Timnite, because he had taken his wife and given her to his companion. And the Philistines came up and burnt her and her father with fire. Look at that one. Well, these are, these are even pagans. If Samson, Samson an Israelite, Samson a judge in Israel, Something a leader in Israel. If he could take loss into his hand and he forgot the law of God, can you blame the Philistines, the pagans? But the pagans even did not extend the thing. They said, Who offended something? 
that made him to do this and burn our field. They said, is the Timnite because he gave his wife to another person, all right? If that's what he has done, the Philistines were even more reasonable than Samson. They said, all right, we'll deal with that man and his daughter. Look at Samson now, verse 7. And Samson said unto them, Though ye have done this, yet will I be avenged. He wanted to revenge of you. And after that, I will cease. And he smote them, heap and tie, with a great slaughter. And he went down and dwelt on the top of the rock Etam. Killed many people. Because a family offended him. That's what they were trying to avoid in the Old Testament. That's why Jesus said, you have heard that it had been said in the Old Covenant to moderate the actions of people, to limit the actions of people, to make them to cool down in the process of justice. While the judges are looking at the matter so that the emotion will come down, it will be tooth for tooth and teeth for touch, but and the eye for eye. But you know, even Samson did not even carry that out. But now, at the time of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Pharisees had got to the position where the just did whatever they wanted. They didn't treat their Old Testament very well. Look at Leviticus chapter 19 verse 18. Leviticus chapter 19 verse 18. Here we are told in chapter 19 verse 18. Thou shalt not avenge. I wish something had read this one. An Israelite. Thou shalt not avenge. I wished Esau. Would have learned this at his own time. Thou shalt not avenge, nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people. But thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. You know, before when somebody does something to you, they step on your toes. Why don't you ask questions? Did he do that deliberately? Or did he just mistakenly do that? Was that an error in his judgment? Was that a mistake on his part? Is that a kind of habit he's trying to break and he has not succeeded in breaking that habit and that habit, bad habit, just splashed on me? Is it his immaturity? The man, the young man is still developing. He has not well developed and therefore his immaturity is coming out in his action. If it is it's immaturity, sometimes people who are immature, they are not deliberate, they are just immature. Why don't you ask questions? Why don't you come to those of us who are leaders in the church? So and so has done this to me. You know them more than I know them. You know her more than I know her. And then the judges will try to find out, the counselors, the leaders, the pastors, our overseers will try to find out what is the real matter. But you know, there are people that are not waiting for all that process. They take laws into their hands and they do whatever they want to do. And they pull the whole congregation down. And they pull the whole church down in their moment of madness and anger. That's what the Lord is saying. It shall not be so among you, the disciples of the Lord. I come to point number two. Manifestation of a life without retaliation. In Matthew chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 39. Matthew chapter 5, verse 39. But I say unto you, what an authority. Here comes Christ again. And he tells us, this is what you learned in the past. Put into the hands of the judges that the Pharisees have now put into the hand of everyone. That everybody goes about retaliating and revenging, taking loss into their hands. It says, but I say unto you, whatever your culture says. Whatever your tradition says, whatever your mind says, whatever the activists say, you know there are activists today, civil, those people that are activists, they come out. And sometimes those activists, they kind of influence the thinking of society. 
when something, a problem that is say uh, that they have with the government, maybe with the decision that the president has taken, a decision that the governor of the state has taken. Instead of going to the governor and sitting down and settling with him, they come to the street. Hey, don't come to my street. I didn't know when the governor took that decision. And then they block the road and begin to just, you know, smash cars. All these cars were smashing. We didn't know when the governor took that decision. And then people are killed and lives are wasted. That's what the Lord is saying, that Christians will not take part in anything like that. That if there is a problem with an individual, go to that individual and resolve that problem with that individual. Don't take laws in turn. He said, but I say unto you, whatever your culture says, whatever your tradition says, and whatever the activists, whatever they say, and whatever you say, your personal principle says. You know, there are people that will say, I have a personal principle. Whenever this happens, this is the way by personal principle I deal with it. My friend, Christ is greater than your personal principle. Jesus said, but I say unto you, and then whatever the contemporary example you may find, so and so, that is how he deals with the problem. Our leader, our overseer, our pastor, that's how he deals with the problem. Christ is greater than the example of the person you are referring to. And Jesus said, but I say unto you that ye shall that ye resist not evil. That ye resist not evil. To start with, hands down. Don't you ever bend down to pick a stone and say, You threw that thing at me, I'll throw it back to you. That ye resist no evil. This is grace. This is power under control. This is conversion. Real Christianity. This is how you know the Christian from the pagan. This is how you know the one that is in Christ from the one that is not in Christ. Here Christ says, but I say unto you, on any matter, at any time, in any occasion, Whatever the situation, and whatever they have said, whatever they have done, wherever they are coming from, however painful that thing might be to you, that she resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Now, we need to understand what Christ was actually saying. Because now, as the Pharisees misunderstood verse 38, so also there are many people that misunderstand verse 39. Can I tell you this? Before you apply verse 39, let us see what it does not mean. Verse 39 is not talking about the citizens and the government. Think about this. It's not talking about the king and the subject, the Lord is not telling the king, if your subject smites you on the one cheek, turn to him the other also. It's not a relationship between king and citizen. Number two, it is not a, it is not a regulation, a principle between the parents and the children. This is not applicable in the family. It's not saying if your child smites you on the one cheek, turn to him the other also. No, train up your child in the way he should go. As that little child is growing up, if the child raises up the hand to beat mommy, you hold that hand. You say, no, I'm your mother. You don't do that to mommy. That is bad. You might even discipline that child. You cannot tell the mother, ah, 
Why are you correcting that child? Didn't Jesus say, when somebody smites you on the one cheek, you turn the other house? No, this one is not applicable to the relationship between children and parents. Number three, it is not applicable to relationship between the learner and the teacher. We send our children to school. And then our child, as they get to school, the teacher gives them something to do. And the child says, no, I will not do it. And the teacher says, you have to do it. That's why you came to school. I'm trying to teach you and develop you. And then the child raises up the hand and smiles the teacher. You cannot quote this to the teacher. The teacher is a man of authority over that child. And you cannot say, yes, teacher, when the student smites you on the one cheek, turn the other also. That's a misrepresentation of the word of God. This is not applicable to the disciple and the master. Jesus Christ had disciples. You have James, John, Peter, Matthew, the rest of them. And Jesus was not saying that if the disciple smites the master on the one cheek, he should turn the other also. This is not for disciple and master relationship. In fact, you remember there was a time that Jesus Christ was talking to his own disciples. And then he was saying, I'm going to go to the cross and die. And then Peter took him up and said, Lord, that will not happen to you. Jesus did not turn the other cheek to Peter and say, tell me that again. He said, get thee behind me, Satan. He was master. And Peter was a disciple. And you cannot apply this to master-disciple relationship. And say, Jesus, but didn't you say... If somebody smites you on the cheek, on the right cheek, you turn the other to him also. He says, no, this is not for disciple and master. Number five, this is not for employees and employers. Employees and employers. An employee is employed in a place of work. And he has a work to do. And the employer pays him for what he does. And his living depends on what the employer is paying him. And the word of God from cover to cover tells us how the employer ought to behave to the employee. Um, and so how the employee ought to behave to the employer. And then, let's say for example, the employee gets out of his way. And then he smiles the director. He smiles the manager. He smites the employer. And then the employer, you know, goes to his office and writes a letter of termination. We have code of conduct in our place of work here. If anybody is going to work here, we are for productivity. And if we're going to produce, somebody has to set the goal and set the vision and then tell us what we're going to produce at the end of the week. And those who are going to work here must go through that process of productivity so that we can make some profit and some gain. And if we cannot tell you what to do and you smite the employer, then we show you the way out. You cannot tell that employer, but Jesus said, if somebody smites you on the one cheek, turn the other to him also. This is not applicable. To employees and employers. You see, many people, when they don't understand the word of God, they take that word of God out and then they bring it to be applicable in situations where they're not applicable. What was Jesus saying? Before I tell you what Jesus actually meant, let me show you what happened to the Lord Jesus Christ himself. John chapter 18. In John chapter 18, I'm reading from verse 22 and verse 23. John chapter 18 verse 22 and when he had thus spoken one of the officers which stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand saying as rest thou the high priest so think about this now here Jesus Christ was being tried he had been betrayed by Judas Iscariot and uh, as they were questioning him Somebody said something wrong. And Jesus answered the way he ought to answer. 
And then one of the officers there that stood by struck Jesus on the palm of the hand, saying, As rest thou, the high priest, so Jesus answered him, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why smitest thou me? Do you see that? He didn't just turn the other cheek and say, okay, this is the other one. Smite the other one. It is the life of Christ that makes us to understand the interpretation of the message of Christ. Which means then, if somebody slaps you, it's, the Lord is not saying that literally stay there and let him snap the other part. If somebody, you know, if there's rioting somewhere and the people, these thugs and hooligans are running about and then somebody wants to use a machete on you, that you'll just stay there and say, Jesus said, I should turn the other cheek. You caught my leg. Here is my hand. Can you cut the hand? And then we we'll say, how did you lose your leg and your hand? I came to the Bible study and you taught us the word of God. That if somebody smites us on the one cheek, we turn the other also. They only caught my leg and then I gave my hand to them. You didn't follow the Bible study then? Because that's not what Jesus meant. All that Jesus was teaching us. You'll find out as you read the whole Bible. What he's telling us is this. Look at Proverbs chapter 20. Proverbs chapter 20 verse 22. Say thou not, I will recompense evil. That's what he means. Don't retaliate. Don't say, I will recompense evil. You hurt me, I'll hurt you. You slap me, I will slap you. He's just saying, be willing to even give him the second part to smite. Let there be that surrender in you. Be dead to sell. That whatever they do, you say, well, it doesn't matter. I'm praying for you. You're doing that because of your ignorance. You're doing that because of the nature of the devil in you. It's not your fault. It's your fault on the one hand. It's not your fault on the other hand. You are acting according to who you are. A fish will swim. A bird will fly. A driver will drive. A sinner will sin. That's why you're doing what you're doing. I'm not surprised. I'm praying for you. That's what Jesus meant. It didn't mean that literally you offer yourself that they should smite you more and destroy you and cause you more pain. It doesn't be dead to self and be willing. Don't run away. Now that, that's what the Lord is saying. Stay there. You have a duty. You have a work to do. And somebody is trying to hurt you in that place you are doing the work. Don't run away and become a coward. Stay there and be dead to self. That even if they are going to smite you the second time, let them go ahead. That's what he means. But don't retaliate. Look at that again. Proverbs 20 verse 22. Say not thou, I will recompense evil, but wait on the Lord, and he shall save thee. Proverbs chapter 24, verse 29. 24, verse 29. Say not, I will do to him as he has done to me. Now that's what the Lord is telling us. He smites you, don't raise your hand and smite him. Just smile it up. Just concentrate on another thing. Just look at his soul. And look at the need of his soul. And while he smites you like that, think about his eternity. And think about where this man, if he doesn't have a change of nature, a change of life, where he will spend eternity, be thinking about how can I help him to redirect and refocus his thoughts, his mind, his life, so that he'll be able to walk the right direction. That's what you should be thinking. About. Not thinking about yourself. He smote me. I felt the pain. I'll teach him a lesson and show him how painful this is. No, that's not the Christian way. While they smite you like that, number one, be dead. So that's smiting. That's smiting. How painful will it be one week from now? 
That smiting, how painful will it be one year from now? That smiting, how painful will that be 50 years from now? It's nothing. And therefore, you stay there. I can even bear another smiting again. I'm dead. That's what the Lord is saying. Be dead to the pain. And be dead even to the pleasure. And be dead to everything. And just be thinking about your ministry. How can I help this man to stop smiting people? And do not say you are going to revenge. Say not, I will do so to him as he has done to me. I will render to the man according to his work. In Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Living a life without revenge. A life without retaliation. A life that bears no grudge. A life that has no animosity or hatred against anybody. Romans chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 17. Recompense to no man evil for evil. That's what he's teaching us. There is evil in the world. And there are many people that will, maybe they don't even hate you in particular. That's just their nature. You know, sometimes you get in the bus and it's the bus conductor. Rough. That's his life. It's not because of you. If you were not there, that bus conductor will be robbed to another person. It's not just you. You know, sometimes you meet somebody and then he talks to you harsh. And you say, this is bad. Then you look at yourself. What have I done? It's not you. That's his nature. That's the way he is. And that's his character. If you were not there, he'll do that same thing to another person. Don't take it personally. Be praying for him. Be dead to that sin. You know, sometimes you'll find somebody, you've not offended him, and you're just going your way, living your normal life, and the fellow, he's been angry from home. He's been angry from where he was coming from, and already he's bottled in. He has all this smoke and fire within. He has some frustration. And you are the first person he met. And then he just offloaded all that frustration on you. Say, what? What have I done? You've done nothing. That's him. That's the way he is. He was like that from home. That's his nature. And therefore, you don't take offense. Don't say, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to show him. Don't show him anything. Just live your life. That's what the Lord is teaching us here. And it says, recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible as much as lies in you, live peaceably with all men. Live peaceably with all men. If everybody is making fire, the world will be too hot for us to live in. If they make fire there, and they make fire there, carry some water in your hand. Let somebody have the grace and the understanding that if everybody carries fire around, the place will be too hot for us to live. And because their nature is carrying fire and they have all this fire brand they are throwing here and there, let somebody bring some water along. That's what he's saying. Because if you retaliate, if you revenge, if they do that and then you strike back, there will be war every time. How can we live in a state of war all through our lives? And it's going to take somebody to have the spirit of Christ. The mind of Christ, the love of Christ, the life, the wisdom of Christ. To be able to bring some change and some peace and some rest of mind in a community. If it be possible, as much as lies in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto us. For it is written, vengeance is mine, and I will repay. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, somebody who smote you yesterday, now he gets hungry. You know what's the natural way to think about that? Thank God the man is hungry today. He is so weak now because he's starving. And he will not have strength to lift up the hand and smite me today because the man is hungry. He said, feed him. But if I feed him, his science will be strong again. And if his nature has not changed, he'll have strength to smite me again. That's what Jesus said. When he smites you on the one cheek, turn the other also. That's the interpretation. 
help him. Give him food. Give him strength. And if he wants to use the strength on the hand to smite you, turn the other cheek, or let him do it. He will get tired. If he's progressing his hatred, you progress in love. If he's progressing in aggressive action, you progress in gentle attitude. And that is what will change our world. That's what the Lord is saying. Therefore, if an enemy hunger, feed him. Don't strike him. Don't fight him. Don't knock him. Don't destroy him. Don't pray against him. Don't send it back to the sender. This church for many years had been the beacon of light and the example to all the churches in this country. And if anybody wanted to know the right interpretation, application, living out the word of God, they will look at what we say in the word of God, how we live in the word of God. But of research, some other ministries and churches are rising up. And they specialize not in turning the other cheek. They specialize. If you give them one blow, they'll give you ten blows. And the language is send it back to the sender. And there are people on those seats here this evening that have learned the language of those people that have not studied about the love of God, about the spirit of Christ. And it's now in your mouth. Send it back to the sender. It's of the devil. That's not of Christ. That's not a message of love. The message of love is. If your enemy hunger. Don't smite him. Don't fast and pray that he should die. Don't call fire upon him. Feed him. If he's hungry. Give him, give him something to drink. And then he says, for in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. You will melt him down to conviction. And then he says, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. That's what the Lord is teaching us. We're going to follow it. I said, we're going to follow it. Other people shall follow us as we study the word of God. Not that we'll be following the other people and then we get back the nature of the lion or the nature of the tiger or the nature of the devil. We need to preserve the nature of Christ in us. We come now to point number three. In point number three, we're looking at the master's model of love and righteousness the master's model of love and righteousness matthew chapter 5 i'm reading from verse 40 to verse 42 matthew chapter 5 verse 40 and if any man will sue thee and the law and take away thy coat let him have thy cloak also and whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile go with him twain Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that will borrow of thee, turn not thou away. Seems like all the verses we're looking at today needs a real explanation before we can understand. In this verse 40, what would it mean? We need to know what it doesn't mean. And we need to know where it does not apply. The word of God teaches the believer to maintain a life of righteousness in his relationship to the government. To maintain a life of righteousness and purity in his relationship as members of the family. And to maintain that kind of righteousness and holiness within the brethren in the church and then to the neighbors and then to the enemies in the world. These are different relationships and they are often addressed in different passages of scripture. If we take a verse of scripture out of context, its context of controlling our attitude towards the enemies and the persecutors, and we apply it to a family fellowship relationship, our interpretation will be misleading. What does that mean? Let's look at verse 14. 
If a man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. It's talking about a believer and an unbeliever. It's not talking about a believer and a believer. A believer is not to take another believer to court. A believer is not supposed to take a fellow child of God to the court of law in the world. So as you read this, if a man, this is a man of the world, this is an adversary, will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. You know, sometimes a daughter wants to wear the dress of the mother. No, that's all right. You know, the, the daughter comes and says, Mommy, I'm going to wear this dress today because now I'm as big as you. You know, that's a family. That's okay. But the mother may say, Oh, my daughter, no. I actually wanted to wear that dress. It would be wrong for that daughter to say, But, Mommy, if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him that have thy cloak also. I said I wanted this dress. If you were following Christ, you say, yes, my daughter, take that and take this also. That's not applicable. That's not for the family. This is for an adversary, an enemy that will not be persuaded and they will take you to the law court outside. You see, if you just read the Bible and then you apply it just here and there to any situation, you're going to mislead yourself. And then let's look at it in verse 41. In verse 41 it says, And uh, whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. What does that mean? You, you, are, you have a common kitchen in your place, uh, in the place you live. And then you're cooking. As you're finishing the food, then your neighbor, who doesn't ever want to cook, he says, huh, that uh, plate of rice is for me. You say, no, it's for my husband. I'm cooking. Oh, no. Because he says, if anybody will compel thee to go a mile, go with him twin, I compel thee, give me that bowl of rice. And then you say, okay, to obey the Bible, I give you, and this is the pot of stoop to follow after it. That one is not Bible. That's ignorance. This is not talking about a neighbor to a neighbor. I'll show you what it means now. And then in verse 40, you give to him that has cursed thee. And from him that will borrow of thee, turn not thou away. Here you have some money in your hand. And this money is to pay your house rent. And in about two hours time, the landlord will come. And the landlord will say, here we are. I need my rent now. But before the two hours expired, somebody came to you. And he said, please, my brother, I have a very important and urgent need. I have, I have need of this particular amount. And it's exactly that amount you have reserved to pay to the landlord. And then you say, I'm sorry, the only amount of money I have, I'm going to give it to the landlord in two hours' time. And then this fellow says, but no, haven't you read the Bible? I came here first, before the landlord, and I'm telling you to give me this and let me now. If you say you are a Christian, give it to me. That's not Christianity. We need to understand that money does not belong to you really. It belongs to the landlord. And the landlord in about two hours time is coming to collect that amount of money. And if you don't pay him, you have a kind of uh, shown that you are not a real Christian. Because you are not actually doing what you ought to do as a dutiful, loyal, faithful tenant. And so you cannot give him that money and say you're obeying the Bible. What does it mean then? Well, we need to understand what it actually means. Let's look at them one by one. And if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. I told you it's not applicable to the believer, to another believer. Matthew chapter 18. In Matthew chapter 18, I'm reading from verse 15. Matthew 18 verse 15, moreover, if thy brother shall 
trespass against thee. Go, tell him his fault between him, between thee and him alone. No law court between brother and brother. Go and tell him. And then it says, and if he shall hear thee, then again thy brother. If he will not hear thee, then take thee one or two more. That in the mouths of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. That's Christianity. That's how to follow Christ. When somebody has offended you, don't gossip. Don't backbite. Don't murmur. Don't speak evil. Don't go around crucifying that individual everywhere. Jesus said, if somebody has offended you, don't publicize that. Go to him. Between you and him alone. And then if you explain everything and you put it on the table, if he says so, I'm sorry. That finishes it. But if he says no, I don't agree. Still, you will not gossip. What do you do? You get two or three others. And then you table it before them. And they are able to talk to him. Then Jesus said, if he listens to them, if he shall, ne if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it to the church. When somebody has offended you, and you have spoken to him, and he has not agreed, then you call two friends, he has not agreed. Tell it to the leadership of the church. That means that's giving us an assumption that we respect the leadership of the church. That the leadership of the church will be able to talk to that individual. Because if there is no respect, do you see? If we don't respect the leadership of the church above the membership of the church, there's nobody to take any case to. If we belittle everybody the same way, and we treat the leadership like the membership, there is no final court of appeal. But when you have not been able to resolve it among the membership, there is enough respect for the leadership that then we go to the church, the leadership of the church, and you tell it, if he neglect to hear the church, the leadership of the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. Let him be like a sinner. Because now it's gone beyond the perimeters and the territory of grace. But when it is an outsider, that's when you talk about him taking you to court. You are not the one taking him to court. He is the one taking you to court. In 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter 6, reading from verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, reading from verse 1. Dear any of you, can you ever imagine this? Dear any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust and not before the saints. Do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge the angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are the least esteemed in the church. When we have matters, we don't go to the law court. We don't go to the village and uh, the village uh, kind of uh, elders. I speak this to a shame. Is it so? That there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren, but brother goes to law, to the law court with brother. And that before the, unjust, before the unbelievers. Now therefore there is utterly a fault among you. Because ye go to law one with another. Why do ye not rather take wrong? That's the teaching. Instead of going to the law court, rather take the wrong. He takes your coat, let him take your cloak also. He wants to cheat you. Give it back to him. And just say the Lord will repay you for whatever you lose. Why do ye not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? That's what the Lord is saying. He's talking about the unbelievers. That those people that they said they were believers. But now they are backslidden. Now they take you to the law court. And then he says leave it to them. Let's come back to Matthew chapter 5. 
Matthew chapter 5, we're looking at verse 40, verse 41 now. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. What a verse. Uh, you are going somewhere. Let's say, for example, I'm going for a crusade. And as I'm going for a crusade, um, somebody just uh, came across me and said, Pastor, I need your attention. I said, please, I'm very busy now. I'm going somewhere now. And then he says, no. And I say, what the problem? He said, there's somebody who is sick. He mentioned the street in a one corner somewhere. And he says, come along with me. And then he says, because the Bible said, if any man shall compel thee to go within one mile, then go with him to him. And that fellow with his understanding of the Bible is expecting me to leave the crusade where you have 100,000, 200,000 people waiting and to follow him to the corner of the street because I am compelled to go with him. And then I abandon what I'm going to do. And then I say, okay, I'm here now. And then they tell a lot of long stories. And then after we finish that, they expect me to say, all right, let's forget crusade now. Is there another person before I leave? I want to go the extra mile. Oh, they say this pastor understands the Bible. No, that pastor misunderstands the Bible. How did what did Jesus say? How did Jesus teach? Matthew chapter, let's look at it. Matthew chapter 10. In Matthew chapter 10, here we are. In Matthew chapter 10, the Lord is telling us. How we should do it. Because of our time, let me go to Luke. In Luke, we're looking at when he sent his disciples out. And these disciples, eh, they, were to, they were to preach the word. And they were to go and do what he wanted them to do. It tells us in chapter 10 verse 3 of Luke. Go your ways. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. Carry neither paws, nor scrip, nor shoes. Salute no man by the way. You're going to do something more urgent. Something very important. Something very essential. Something that is soul saving. And this is not the time. If somebody compels you to go a mile, then go with him twain. You see, there are many people, they read the Bible upside down. And that's why some of you that don't understand the Bible, that's why you'll be judging your pastor in, a, in an uncharitable manner. You know, the Bible says, if any man will compel you to go a mile, go with him twain. I see the pastor is teaching the Bible and he doesn't follow that scene. The other day I wanted to get his attention and I said, Pastor, Pastor, can I see you and just tell you something? Just, just 30 minutes old. And the pastor said, no, I don't have time now. I'm going to such and such a place. But doesn't the Bible say, yes, the Bible says, but what does it mean? Here the Lord Jesus Christ said to his own disciples that he sent out. And as he sent them out, he said, as you are going, you will make sure that you focus your attention, your concentration on what I have sent you to do. Keep on going. If somebody meets you by the way, and then it's going to take your time. You know how they salute people in those days, and even in some cultures today, how they salute them. They will, you know, stay there and be exchanging pleasantries and exchanging greetings. Like, you don't have time to do that. This is not the time to wait and do any other thing. Therefore, you cannot apply this to if any man compels you to go one mile, go with him to an Okay, now what does it really mean? Let's see what it means. You see, in those days, the children of Israel, they were under the Roman law, under the Roman rule. And there were soldiers everywhere. And those soldiers, they were men of authority. And it was incorporated into their law that if a soldier was going to carry something, a baggage, and is going to take it to that place because they were national assignment. The country, um, that is Italy, Rome, they gave them the authority that anybody they got, they'll just say, hey, stop there, carry this thing, 
and then follow and they will follow that's what jesus is saying he says don't fight with those soldiers they are here they are here they are occupying your land and therefore if any soldier any man any man there is you know one of those people of authority will catch you and say carry this in and then follow me you go and don't have any ill ill feeling against him just do it pleasantly and just do it with joy and then when you get to the end of the road you are still ready to go another man let me show you an indication of that that is an instance when that happened matthew chapter 27 in Matthew chapter 27, we're looking at verse 32. Matthew chapter 27, verse 32. Here we are. It says, And as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. Him they compelled to bear his cross. That's what it means. When those soldiers arrested Jesus Christ, and they were taken into the place of crucifixion. And then they saw this fellow Simon of Cyrene. They said, hey, come on here. Pick up this cross and follow after us. And that man did not have a chance. He had to do it. And the Lord said, don't get angry. And don't get emotionally all stirred up. Just relax and say, well, I'm in the hands of the soldiers tonight. Then get it done. And be willing to go the second mile now we're coming to matthew chapter 5 and verse 42 matthew chapter 5 verse 42 give to him that asketh thee and from him that will borrow of thee turn not thou away i've already explained this it doesn't mean that anything you have just give just give without ever thinking of the implication now let's look at the word of god again how did jesus christ himself how did he apply the word? Did everybody that come to Jesus try to say, give me this, give me this. Did he just give them, whether it was right or not right? Mark chapter 10. In Mark chapter 10, we're looking at verse 35. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, come unto him, saying, Master, we would that thou shouldest do for us whatsoever we shall desire. And he said unto them, What would ye that I should do for you? And he said unto him, Grant unto us that we may sit one on thy right hand and the other on thy left hand in thy glory. But Jesus said unto them, Ye know not what ye ask. Can ye drink of the cup that I, that I drink of and be baptized with the baptism that I shall be baptized with? And he said unto him, We can. Jesus said unto them, Ye shall indeed drink of the cup that I drink of, and, that, and with the baptism that I'm baptized, with that shall ye be baptized. But to sit on, on my right hand, on my left hand, is not mine to give. It's not mine to give. But it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared. You see the application that Jesus made? James and John, they came to Jesus. And he said, give us this place and that place. If you were to look at the words of Jesus Christ, anybody that comes to you, whatever they say, give them, just give them. If you don't balance everything up, you'll be giving people what they shouldn't have. But Jesus said to James and John, he said, no, this is not in that realm. I cannot give you that position because it is not prepared or for you. Let's look at Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, we're looking at verse 18. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the hands of the apostles, the Holy Ghost was given. He offered them money saying, give me also this power. You remember the words of Jesus, give to him that asketh of thee. And Simon came and said, give me also this power. You must look at their intention, their ambition, their pride, their covetousness, their state of heart. You cannot just give somebody something if it's going to hurt him. You cannot give him something if it's not going to be useful to him. You cannot give him something if it's going to destroy him. 
Here Simon came and he said, give me this power that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. And Peter said unto him, thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter. You know, somebody may come to you, you know, may come to a pastor, may come to a person like me and say, Now, if Pastor, I've been praying, you know, sometimes they come like that. And as I've been praying, the Lord has sent me to you that you should give me something. And I say, What is it? He says, Okay, before I tell you what it is, promise me that you will obey the Lord and give me. I say, Please, don't waste your time. Tell me what it is, all right? The Lord says you give me the position of a pastor over a region. And the Bible says, whatever we ask you, you give. And if you want to borrow anything, don't say no. I say, well, this one we cannot give you. You're ambitious, you're pride. Go and settle the pride first. Settle your life first. There are qualifications, biblical qualifications, before you can have this position and this right. You know, it's not just to just quote the Bible superficially. We must understand where you are coming from and what you really have. Proverbs chapter 22 verse 16. Proverbs chapter 22. We're reading verse 16. He that oppresses the poor increases his, and increases his riches. He that oppresses the poor to increase his riches. And he that giveth to the rich. He that giveth to the rich. Sometimes somebody is already rich. And then he comes to ask you because he's covetous. You're not to feed their covetousness. You're to say no to them. You have enough. But he that gives to the rich shall surely come to want. And that's why we should read the word of God and read the whole thing and balance everything up. In Luke chapter 16, what an important study we have tonight for us to understand what the Lord actually wants us to understand. Luke chapter 16, I'm reading from verse 11. If therefore ye have not been faithful in the righteous mammon, who will commit to your trust to riches? And if ye have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? Those are the words of Christ. You have been given something before. You misused it. You didn't have the wisdom, the maturity to handle it well. And then you come again, give me this. We say no. But Jesus said, whosoever will come to you and demand anything, give it to them. And whosoever will borrow of you, don't reject them. Just give them. But the same Jesus said, if you have not been faithful in the ones you've got before, prove your faithfulness first. Because if you are not faithful, who will give you that which is your own? In 1 Timothy chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 8. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8. But if any man provide not for his own, especially for those of his own house, he has denied the faith, is worse than an infidel. You know, these are good, good people, nice, nice people, infidels. They will not take care of their family. They will not take care of their children. They will not take care of their wives. But they will be giving money out, dashing money out to strangers. Anybody that comes to them, bro, I need this. They just put their hands in their pocket and just give out. Anybody that comes and says, uh, you know, my uncle, I need this. They just give the money and the wife is suffering. And the children are suffering. You are not obeying the words of Christ. The money you ought to take to take care of your wife and your children, they are the number one. Mark chapter 7, verse 27. In Mark chapter 7, looking at verse 27, But Jesus said unto her, Let the children first be filled. Let the children first be 
be filled. You will take care of your children first. If there is any extra, then you'll be able to give out. Take care of your family first. Then if there is any extra, then you'll be able to give out. What a great thing we're learning that the Lord is telling us there are some things you cannot give out. Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 3. Deuteronomy chapter 7. We're looking at verse 3. In Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 3. Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughters thou shalt not give unto a son. You're a believer. And somebody comes and he, you know, he's coaching the Bible. I want to ask something from your family and the bible says if anybody comes to you to ask for anything just give them don't you don't reject what do you want we want to have your daughter we want you to give your daughter to us in marriage young believers we don't do that it says you will not give them unto your son no his daughter shall thou take Unto thy son, be not unequally yoked together with some believers. It is after we have understood all that now. If you have extra remaining, then you are able to give out and do good with the extra. Galatians, as we stop, as we come to the conclusion, Galatians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. Galatians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. And let us not be weary in well doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men. Notice what follows, especially. Let us do good to all men generally, but here is where to place the emphasis, especially unto them who are the household. Of faith. Those are the wonderful things the Lord has taught us tonight. Telling us, ye have heard. It has been said, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. That's for the judges, for the law court. But I say unto you, there's a final authority. That ye resist not evil. Don't fight back. Don't retaliate. Don't revenge. But whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man shall sue thee at the law, that's an adversary, an unbeliever, a pagan, and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. Don't spend all your time, all your money paying those lawyers. If anybody wants to take anything, let them take it. You are better off rather than taking a lawyer to, you know, follow a lawsuit. And the thing never ends. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile. That is, those military people, if they have authority of the government behind them to do what they are doing, go with him to him. Give to him that asketh thee, after you've taken care of your family, and you've taken care of the compulsory expenses in your life. Give to him that asketh of thee, and from him that will borrow of thee, turn not thou away. The Lord has taught us a lot, and I pray that the grace of God will work mightily in every one of our lives to be able to follow through this word in a practical way in Jesus' name. A good, good amen. amen. We'll rise up and talk to the Lord that the Lord has given us understanding tonight. And with the understanding the Lord has given us, we want to be able to now follow through and say, Lord, thank you. Praise your name that the word of God is so very clear. I want to be able to follow and do and obey, observe what the Lord has taught us. Talk to the Lord in prayer. These are practical lessons. Let's thank the Lord that he has taught us that we don't take laws into our hand. Don't take laws into our hand. And just begin to misbehave retaliate revenge and become a law unto ourselves and turn society into a jungle let's talk to the lord and the lord will help us to behave the way christians ought to behave to act the way christians ought to act to respect the glory of the Lord, the honor of the Lord, and to respect the word of the Lord, having the spirit of Christ, having this, 
mind of Christ, having the love of Christ, having the life of Christ, having the wisdom of Christ. No revenge, no retaliation, no grudges. If it's mighty on the one cheek, it takes two to make a fight. If they start it, don't follow them. Too much fire, too much heat. Let somebody have grace to bring some water and cool this environment. Let somebody have some love to cool this tense, heated environment. If they want to start a fight, be meek. Be gentle, be loving. Takes two to fight. If they shout, be deaf and dumb. They smite you, be dead to the pain. Be blind to the negative action. Be a peace lover. Be a peacemaker. That's how to turn the other cheek. Don't let society hear your voice screaming and shouting and fighting. The sin is screaming. Let it be, let it be the other man alone. There's any anger, let it be other woman alone, not you. Don't react to their anger, to their violence. Takes two to fight. And if anyone will see you are the law, they don't like a peaceful settlement. They want to drag you to the public court of law. Let them take what they want to take. What's the value of that coat and that cloak 50 years from now? Leave it for them. Don't fight for your right. You'll get another one anyhow. Leave it for them. But understand, it's not talking about they taking your wife. You can't leave that for them. It's not talking about taking your children. You can't leave that for them. It's not talking about taking the doctrine from your hand. You can't leave that for them. If it's a coach, material thing, something that doesn't matter, that will not matter in two years, three years from now, leave it for them. If it's your conviction, you cannot leave that for them. They cannot take that. They must not take that. If it's your consecration, you cannot leave that for them. That one is, that's heaven. That one is, is your title deed, your ticket to glory. You cannot leave that for them. But if it's a coat, if they want to take your coat, let them have the cloak also. If it's a literal material sin, irrelevant sin, insignificant sin, something that doesn't matter for eternity, let them take that, leave it for them. But don't give up your conviction. Don't give up the doctrine. Don't give up the truth. Don't give up your family. Don't give up your church. And say if they want to take it, let them take it. No, they cannot take that one. You'll rather die than allow them to take that. But if they want to take your cloak, let them have the coat or whatever also.
They are compelling you to go one mile. Well, if they have authority to do that, don't fight. You can submit to things that don't contradict your commitment to God. Give it up to them. If it doesn't touch your commitment, your service to God. Be dead to self. The conclusion is, don't fight on things of the world. Give up your right if you have to. And be a man of peace. And be a woman of peace. Take care of your family. Don't say you are so generous and giving out money and giving out this and giving out that. And then you are not taking care of your wife. You are not taking care of your children. You are not taking care of your spiritual life. First things first. After you have met the compulsory needs of your family, of your spiritual life, of your commitment to God, then of what remains, give to them that ask you. And they that will borrow of you, don't deny them. Tell the Lord to give you the life of Christ, the mind of Christ, the spirit of Christ, the love of Christ. While sinners sin, let saints live in holiness, righteousness, purity. While the people of the world live like the children of this world, let the people of God live like children of God.